Hello, I'm Stephen Cole, and welcome to the Answers Project podcast from CGTN Europe, where we try and find answers, or at least make sense of, some of the trickiest questions facing us in an increasingly complicated world. We've got access to some of the best brains on the planet to see if they can help shed light on some of the most pressing social, ethical, scientific, geopolitical and philosophical quandaries. And I'm joined by Mari Beveridge, who's going to help me unravel this week's question. So Mari, what are we asking this week? How much is a human life worth? Ah, so... Um... The easy ones first. Um, <laughs> and the easy answer for me is, is of course, uh, all life is priceless. Of course. Um, but we do know it's not as simple as that, Stephen, as always on this podcast. Uh, there are some people in society who have to try and put a figure on the value of human life for all kinds of reasons. Uh, life insurance underwriters, policy makers, people who have to make tricky decisions about who lives or dies in hospital when there are limited resources. And um, here are some of them. What would the victim have earned over a work life? The emotion is extremely difficult. Now that, of course, is very controversial, but it's been the law for 200 years. I fundamentally believe that life is so precious that it is beyond any type of measure. So it's not necessarily about how much our life is worth, but more about what an individual wants to protect. I mean, on an ethical perspective, I would say I cannot assign a value to human life. Statistics could argue yes, my, my heart tells me no. It takes a while to get out of the mindset that lives are only worth the value of your income. And that's the reason why this podcast is trying to answer one of the trickiest questions ever posed uh, about life. And, of course, it's all particularly topical this year because of the virus. Every government's been wrestling with the trade-off between, uh, what, shall we save lives or shall we save our economy? And presumably, that involves economists trying to work out what it's all going to cost and, of course, whether or not we can afford it. That's exactly right. Yeah, this was um, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo back in May 2020 talking about this exact issue. And the question comes back to how much is a human life worth? That's the real discussion that no one is admitting openly or freely, but we should. To me, I say, cost of human life, a human life is priceless, period. Our reopening plan doesn't have a trade-off. Our reopening plan says you monitor the data, you monitor the transmission rate, you monitor the hospitalization rate, you monitor the death rate. If it goes up, you have a quote-unquote circuit breaker. You stop. You close the valve on reopening. But it is a conversation that we should have openly. Hard conversation, painful conversation, uh, controversial conversation, yes, all of the above. But it's also the right conversation. That's very neatly summarised the dilemma, hasn't it, Andrew Como? Um, so we're going to try and have this difficult conversation, are we, Mari, with uh, hopefully some help from people who really have to think about this kind of thing all the time. Yes, so policymakers and economists have been wrestling with this for as long as there have been policymakers and economists. Um, up until the 1980s, they looked at the cost of death, the medical costs of people being ill and dying, and then the loss of earnings after they died. Um, in the US, they came up with a figure of around $300,000 per human life. Does that sound about right to you? No, it sounds like something just picked off the ground uh, with <laughs> well, somebody who has no idea. But, uh, I mean, th th in theory and from my point of view, in practice, life is priceless. In reality, governments do have to make difficult decisions that save or cost lives. Mathematical models allow us to make fair decisions based on risk and probability. Without maths, mm -hmm. governments would make subjective choices favouring one group over another. By giving a price to life, we ensure, I think, that all life is valued. That's the theory. And putting a price on life supposedly helps government departments plan for the future, but it makes me feel uncomfortable. Well, yes, of course, it's a very, very uncomfortable issue to try and sort of nail anyone down on. But I think the man to go to on this issue is W. Kip Viscusi. Uh, he's a professor at the very prestigious Vanderbilt Law School in Tennessee. And he changed the way people thought about pricing lives in the 1980s. 
the people that say, you know, we're not going to compromise, you know, safety for money or, or, I mean, that makes great speeches, but it's not the way we live. Uh, we don't spend an unlimited amount on safety in any context, whether it's for cars or any other situation. Obviously, we can't spend an unlimited amount of money trying to save a life. Policymakers, governments have to place a monetary value on life in order to work out whether it's worth spending a lot of money to save yeah. lives. I can see that. You could put, uh, for example, speed bumps everywhere and save a lot of lives, but that would cost a lot of money as well as driving a lot of motorists absolutely nuts. Well, exactly, and there aren't unlimited resources. So you've, sort of, you've got to work out a way of putting a price on life in order to figure out how much you're going to have to pay out to try and save them. And I don't suppose you remember a time when you didn't need to wear seatbelts, for example. In fact, Murray, I do rather sadly remember when seatbelts weren't compulsory. And the UK government introduced a safety campaign in the 1970s using the now disgraced television presenter Jimmy Savile to advertise clunk click every trip. <laughs> Nobody obeyed until car companies then made the cars emit a very irritating warning beep if you didn't comply. So, in that case, Nanny State did do some good, but that was a considered campaign. Everything today seems to be introduced in a virtue signalling rush without really enough consultation. A whole industry has grown up around health and safety and regulations have gone way overboard. Um, but that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, no, I was going to say we will need a whole other episode to discuss your views on health and safety, Stephen, I think. Um, but what about safety labels on dangerous chemicals? Uh, Professor Viscusi said that this kind of labeling on, on dangerous chemicals was actually the, the safety regulation that completely changed the way policymakers priced lives. <laughs> The situation was the Occupation and Safety and Health Administration proposed the Hazard Communication Regulation. So for the first time, dangerous chemicals would be labeled in the workplace, which seems like a reasonable thing to do. Uh, but they calculated the benefits of the regulation and calculated the costs. Well, you know, it's interesting regulation, but the costs are greater than the benefits. And the reason was when uh, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration calculated the value of mortality risks reduced, they said that your life is only worth what you make. So it's just based on the future earnings of a worker. That's how they valued the mortality risk. So at a life value of $300,000, it was deemed too expensive to put a load of warning labels on poisonous chemicals, even though it would save lives. After the regulation was rejected, they appealed it to then Vice President Bush, who essentially said, you know, this is a technical issue, let's get somebody in here to solve it. So I was asked to resolve the dispute, and I concluded the Office of Management budget was right on everything except one, is you have to change the number of how much a death is worth. So if you use my estimates of the value of statistical life, which at the time were over $3 million, you increase the benefits of the regulation by a factor of 10, the benefits then exceed the costs. It was a couple of days after my report arrived. In support of the regulation, they issued it. That was the turning point in the United States for adopting this different approach for valuing risks to life. So they've used Professor Viscusi's value for a statistical life since then in the US. And, and he came up with a figure by trying to work out just how much a typical worker would pay to stay safe. So looking at um, how much workers value their lives based on risky jobs that they're willing to take. And um, some jobs are obviously paid more because they have a risk element, like a construction worker maybe putting his or her life at risk and would expect to be paid more because of that. Um, but he also factored in how much people were willing to pay to live in a safer neighborhood or drive a safer car. And um, so how much people are willing to trade off risks of death against money. And he came up with a figure of $3 million in 1982, which updates to around $10 million in today's money. So that means a whole swathe of safety measures would have been introduced because they were now deemed to be more cost efficient. So where did the lives come into this? Making seatbelts compulsory labeling dangerous chemicals and getting rid of, uh, say, asbestos. Was all that value of a statistical life adopted by other countries too, Murray? Yeah, so Professor Viscusi says it's been adopted by some countries, but um, certainly not everywhere. And he said the values can be strikingly different. 
it takes a while to get out of the mindset that lives are only worth the value of your income. But we do know that the higher the number you place on what lives are worth, the more stringent the safety regulations are, the more stringent the environmental regulations will be, and the number of lives that are lost will go down. That sort of makes sense. The higher the value, the more stringent the safety regulations. Now, Murray, I'm a bit uncomfortable about all this putting prices on live stuff. If you ask anyone who has religious faith, they'll tell you straight away uh, you can't put a price on life. Of course, and we, I don't think we can discuss this subject without actually hearing from someone who is a person of faith and um, someone who believes that you can't put a price on human life like yourself. Um, this is Professor Anthony Reddy. He's the director of the Oxford Centre for Religion and Culture. Life is incalculable, certainly in monetary or commercial terms. And I think my basic premise for saying that is that life is a scarce commodity. It's something that we can't create. That I would say as a Christian theologian that, that life is a gift from God. So we can prolong life and we can sustain life and with good development and our ways of social arrangements, we can even enhance life. However, what we can't do is create it in the first place. And therefore, I think for me, any attempt to try to make calculations and some sort of determination as to one life and its value against another life, I think is always problematic. I mean, I understand that people have to do it for various reasons, but I fundamentally believe that life is so precious that it is beyond any type of measure. And I have to say, I, I agree with Professor O'Reddy. You know, I was brought up uh, a Catholic, uh, and in the Catholic faith, a life is to be respected and protected, and that's enshrined in the belief of the sanctity of life. In fact, if you live life according to the Ten Commandments, you'd be a saint, and that I ain't. <laughs> or is, uh, I don't know anybody who is, but that, that's not the point. The point is that life, a baby's uh, or an elderly person's, is sacrosanct. There are arguments about contraception, abortion, euthanasia, and each of those can be justified according to different circumstances. Mm. But the whole point of the life argument is that life in whatever form has to be treated with huge respect and never taken for granted. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I assume that sort of comes under the general Christian belief that only God um, can choose when life begins and ends. Uh, but, but going back to Professor Reddy on this, uh, I mean, apart from being a man of faith, he also has some uh, other very good reasons to feel that it's fundamentally wrong um, to put a monetary value on, on a human being. I'm not just a Christian theologian, I'm, I'm a black liberation theologian. So at its basic, that means it's a theology that is about black empowerment and the attempt to make valuable lives that have in the past have been seen as being of little value or value only in terms of being commodities. So I am a diasporan African. My ancestors were born in Africa, but were taken by the slave trade into the diaspora, mainly in the Caribbean and North America. And there was a time when people like my ancestors were seen as chattels, so we were seen as commodities. And there was a literal value to us because we were not beings, we were objects that could be owned. And so when slavery was abolished in the British Empire in 1833, a price was put on the lives of enslaved people in order for them to be set free, and that price was 20 million pounds. So 20 million pounds was paid to the slave owners, all white Europeans. And therefore, part of my sense of, of it being immoral to put a value along human life is because historically, that's what has happened. So it's less than 200 years. Incredible, isn't it? That was less than two centuries ago. And in today's money, that's something like £16.5 billion, pounds, which was paid out by the British government as compensation to the 3,000 families who owned slaves. And I found some figures, Stephen. Uh, George Orwell's great-grandfather, Charles Blair, received just under £4,500 for the release of 218 slaves he owned. That was around £3 million pounds in today's money. Um, another slave owner, John Austin, received... £20,500 for freeing uh, 415 slaves. It's, it's mind-boggling numbers. Uh, they are mind-boggling, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and do the maths. That, 
I, I work out, I estimate, is somewhere between 20 pounds and 50 pounds per slave. Uh, incredible even to think about people paying money for whole lives, which is uh, exactly what is happening today with modern uh, human trafficking. There are still slaves in Europe and the Middle East and Africa. Yeah. That, that is a, the sad indictment of society that's looking back, perhaps not looking at the current situation. But I can also see why Professor Reddy would have such a problem putting a monetary value on a life even today. We know that one of the dangers of not seeing life as sacred and as being actually sort of beyond value is that at its worst, what you then end up with things like genocide. And we know that one of the dangers, therefore, of the way in which we often have a kind of scale value of life. So life in the industrial West, particularly if it's white life, is more valuable than life, perhaps if it's anonymous people who we see on the news in faraway places, somehow their value somehow becomes less. So therefore, when tragedy happens and lives are lost, we feel bad, but we don't feel absolutely terrible about it. Actually, I want to be idealistic and say all our lives are important. And if we had that sense of every life being sacred, I think some of the scandals of hunger and starvation and war and genocide wouldn't happen precisely because we knew that every life in every part of the world, in every individual, actually needed to be protected. And you can't argue against any of that. Uh, no. They're all really important points, how lives can be valued differently. Uh, and he, uh, of course, uh, hopefully like me, uh, as a man of faith, believe you need to value every life equally. Yeah, and I thought it was interesting what he said about how we feel about lives in faraway places. So when we're faced with like a terrible natural catastrophe or a famine caused by a drought or an earthquake, for example, and how much are we willing to pay uh, to, to try and help save a life? You know, what's a, what's a life worth when we are trying to save it? That's difficult uh, and slightly unfair because, you know, we all have problems in our own areas and we're all That's trying true. to save our own lives and protect our own families. Uh, we can show huge sympathy, we can send contributions, uh, and that is obviously a, a way of digging into our own pockets to try and save a life. But we have so many demands. There are so many uh, appeals for, for money from us. We can't contribute to most. I only contribute to two. Um, uh, we give as much as we can, but there's so many worthy causes out there. People complain, I think sometimes, that they're suffering from, what should we call it, so compassion fatigue, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And whilst I was doing the research for this podcast, um, I actually found a group of researchers who've been looking at this exact thing. Uh, and there's some, some interesting results. My name is Yanis Evangelidis, and I'm an assistant professor of marketing at the Sade Business School in Barcelona, Spain. And I study, I do research on how people make decisions. It could be anything from uh, purchase decisions of products to donation decisions. So earlier in my career, I studied how people donate to victims of natural disaster. And basically I'm studying how you can influence people when they donate. So he was explaining to me that charities have to compete to get donations. And, and like lots of organizations, they'll try and figure out how to maximize the donations they get. People are more sensitive to the number of people who die in the aftermath of a disaster compared to the number of people who survive the disaster but are in need of assistance. We find that donation amounts and donation decisions are heavily influenced by the number of fatalities in a disaster. Essentially, uh, we argue that that's not the right response in a way because uh, we have all these people who survive the disaster who need assistance. If you think about it, oftentimes, in the aftermath of a disaster, you have uh, very few fatalities, but a lot of people who are homeless, injured, who need assistance, People don't react to these victims who survive and are in need as much as to those who unfortunately lose their lives. And that is very interesting. It means uh, people are more likely to do donate when the number of lives lost in an event or a disaster rather is higher. And also, I suppose, the age of the people who are lost in a disaster. If children are involved, mm. I think one of the wonderful things about humanity is if children are involved, more money is sent. Uh, which is which is great. It's deemed, in, in other words, a more worthy cause. Uh, and that is counterintuitive when you think about it. The people who died don't need the money. It's the survivors that need it most. Yeah, well, this is what he was talking about. He, he said that um, in order to carry out this study, they came up with a figure. So we had a 10-year 
a data set of donations to victims of disaster. We run a model on that and we found basically that for every increase, each additional person that lost their lives in the disaster, an additional $9,000 was donated. Obviously, that amount is debatable and you can run different models and get different solutions, but we can all agree that there's a lot of extra money donated for each person that loses their lives in the aftermath of a disaster, much more than a person who actually survives. And when you think about it, uh, that doesn't really make sense. What, what on earth does that tell us, Mari, about human nature? Well, as you can imagine, I asked Yanis about exactly that. I think what it tells us is that there's a lot of predictable biases that we do in the way we approach human life. For example, our paper shows that we react more to a life lost than a life who is not lost but is in need of assistance, which I think we shouldn't be doing, clearly, because uh, we neglect people who need our help. We oftentimes react more to one life than thousands of statistical lives. There's a lot of evidence for that in psychology. So clearly, people don't have the ability to react in a rational, as we say, uh, manner to the number of people who need our help. So we don't have a metric to evaluate human lives inherently, and we're influenced by some sorts of uh, heuristics or biases. Clearly, people don't have the innate ability to assign a monetary value in a rational manner to a human life. So, I, I mean, I found this interview with him so interesting about the fact that we are more likely to pay out lots more money if more people have died in a tragedy, when actually, in, in something like a drought, a lot of people will survive it. Um, and, and, and they are the people that need our money and our resources because they're still alive and they still need to eat and they still need resources. Um, but we're more likely to pay out more money uh, when more of these people have died. It just it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Well, it, it sort of makes sense in a perverse way because yeah. people are clearly trying to show their sympathy uh, to the people who died or hopefully their relatives but, um, and whoever's close to them. I mean, didn't even the, the Catholic nun, Mother Teresa, say something about helping the person next to you first. Uh, yes, I think the quote is, just off the top of my head here, Stephen, I can't help thousands, I can only help the one who stands before me. Yeah, that, that, that's right. So, uh, back to dollars and cents, pounds and pence, perhaps another way we might think about trying to add monetary value on a human life is what someone might think they're worth in terms of, now this is getting banal after what we've heard so far, but life insurance. I mean, if you were to die tomorrow, God forbid, Murray, um, what do you think your life would be worth? I mean, I'm not even 30 yet, Stephen, and we are talking about my life insurance. Um, I, I'm certainly, I certainly haven't thought about it yet. Um, I have no idea what my life is worth in terms of life insurance. Uh, but I do agree it's important to look at it, and I do agree it is a bit banal, but it is a very, very good measure for figuring out how much the life uh, how much a life is worth, which is, of course, the exam question today. Um, so for this, I, I spoke to a woman named Joanna Scott. She is the policy advisor for health and protection insurance at the Association of British Insurers. And I asked her what sort of insurance cover people should be taking out. In terms of how much cover people should take out, every life is different. So this is entirely bespoke to the individual. So it's not necessarily about how much a life is worth, but more about what an individual wants to protect. So, for example, if you have dependents, you might, might you may want to pay off the rest of your mortgage or any other debts and maintain the lifestyle. So if you have young kids, you might want to think about their schooling or university and making sure that this can be factored into your monthly budgets. So say you're planning for a life insurance or take an annuity. Um, what they really want to hear from you is that you're a smoker in the questionnaire, because if you are, they're not going to pay out as much. You're this not going to live as long. This is very cynical of you, Stephen. Uh, but totally factual. Uh, and she says there, um, there isn't a set figure. It's about how much your outgoings are. And if you were to die, could your dependents cover them? She actually did give me more of an idea of what my life would be worth, which is, of course, uh, the most important thing uh, in, in the quest for, for figuring <laughs> this out. Um, and and she, she explained it, of course, in, in monetary terms. People often underestimate how much life insurance they need, um, but a typical rule of thumb is to have a policy which is 10 times your annual salary. But this, again, will depend on things that you want to cover and how affordable that is. So what's really interesting is the discrepancy in how people value their lives uh, according to the jobs they do. Uh, and a survey on money supermarket 
asked people to estimate the amount of life cover they thought they would need. And it found that people in the art and design industry thought they'd need around half a million pounds in life insurance, whereas people working in childcare thought they'd only need around 15,000 pounds. Isn't it strange how we all like to believe that a human life is worth the same amount when it comes down to crunching the numbers? Uh, it, that's not the case at all. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's not just life insurance where people have to look at um, the, the value in terms of their paychecks. It's also a huge issue in, in compensation for disasters. Yeah, which has to be worked out inevitably. I presume you mean people injured or killed in disasters, events outside of their control, in other yeah, words. Yeah, exactly. So I actually spoke to the leading voice on this and, oh my goodness, what a voice. You'll see what I mean in a moment. Uh, Kenneth Feinberg is an American attorney and he specialises in alternative dispute resolution and he's dealt with some of the biggest cases in the US we're talking Deepwater Horizon oil spill the Boston Marathon bombings and possibly the biggest case in US history 9-11 on rare occasions like the 9-11 attacks 20 years ago or the uh, Deepwater Horizon oil rig explosion in the Gulf of Mexico I am called on by President Bush, President Obama, a governor, a mayor, uh, the Congress of the United States to design and administer compensation programs to compensate innocent victims of these disasters. And in so doing, I am delegated the authority to value the lives of those killed or physically injured as a result of these tragedies. And I've been doing this for um, too long, probably about 40 years. We've heard a lot about how to calculate uh, what someone's life is worth throughout this podcast. Uh, it's a particularly important job for this man, Kenneth Feinberg, as well. Um, so I assumed it would be a really difficult formula to create, and uh, I was wrong. This is what he said. No, the formula is not that difficult. The emotion is extremely difficult. It's debilitating. But the actual formulas here in the United States, and I might add in uh, England and in most common law countries, relatively straightforward. You need a calculating machine. What would the victim have earned over a work life but for the tragedy? Now, that, of course, is very controversial, but it's been the law for 200 years, namely a stockbroker or a banker or a lawyer or a doctor, much more compensation than the waiter the busboy, the soldier, the cop, the fireman, they earn more. Which is terrible indictment, isn't it? <laughs> Especially when a banker or a lawyer gets more than a fireman or a soldier. It's the reality, <laughs> though, isn't it? <laughs> Hold on, Mr Feinberg's going to sue me for that. <laughs> uh, but he's right, that is incredibly controversial. He's saying, uh, as a matter of fact, not all lies are equal when it comes down to it. And if you earn more, you'll be compensated more. That is really the crux of it, isn't it? And, and you were saying earlier, how can you put a value on human life? And Kenneth Feinberg is basically saying, well, Stephen, how could you not? In my experience, when it comes to trying to value lives in terms of dollars, there is no set amount. Everyone receives a different amount of money in the courtroom or in an alternative compensation program. Lives are not equal in the eyes of the law. Now, if you're a priest or a rabbi considering variables like dignity and integrity and love and loyalty, well then, maybe you can place some sort of principal value on lives. But I believe that in Western countries like England, like the United States, like Canada, like New Zealand, like Australia, lives are inherently unequal. And it is rare indeed that similar victims of a tragedy receive the same valuation. And that's just a reality of Western societies. I mean, what a fantastic voice on this issue. Um, do, you, do you think that's changed your mind at all? Well, it certainly made me think, because uh, when I was thinking about this last night, I had a little bit of a row with uh, Mrs. Cole. Uh, <laughs> and I thought I'd better examine my life insurance and see how much it's worth. <laughs> uh, but uh, to be honest, to be, uh, to, be, to be completely honest, I'm afraid not really. It hasn't changed my mind. 
and I have to add, the day I ask a lawyer, however eminent and impressive, for advice about humanity is the day I think I'll give up. <laughs> Stephen Cole, ever the optimist. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mari. <laughs> we may not have come up with an exact figure no. for every human life, but you and our guests have certainly given me and our listeners real food for thought, and we're hoping you, our audience, will get in touch to tell us what you think. That's really important to us. If you've got a burning question you'd like answered, we'd love to hear that too. Find us on CGTN Europe's Facebook or Twitter page, and you can also subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher or Spotify. Thanks so much for listening. Goodbye. Goodbye.